NFL podcast. We're too old for this sh- Welcome to another edition of the Around the NFL podcast. My name's Dan Hansis. I come to you from a virtual room filled with heroes. Mark Sessler, Greg Rosenthal. You know what I'm getting too old for? And welcome, audience. I hope your weekend is excellent. What's today, Tuesday? Well, you're in the middle of the week. By the time you hear this, it might be damn Wednesday. There's a long stretch between shows. We did a Wednesday night show. It's pretty rare we go this long between shows. Um, but I'm getting, I got to say, I'm getting sick of this remote life enough. I feel like at a certain point you have to ask questions, um, in our own company because I think everybody else is back in the office now. It feels like the around the NFL podcast is the only one that's being kept now in containment. And I believe we're all vaccinated. We, I feel like we're agreeable fellows and Ricky is, she's a nice girl. I mean, what, what am I missing here? What? Well, I Wait, think some fact, some factual accuracy is what you're missing. I don't, <laughs> I don't think the offices are crowded at all. They, they did start the process of saying if you are vaccinated, fill out these forms. You can start coming in on a voluntary basis. But when you watch the shows, there's literally no one in the newsroom. I and now like... they, they're actually pulling back from the studio shows. I think because they're preparing to move to the next place. I don't think almost anyone is there, and I think I very think few had, people um... filled that out. Colleen back in the studio last March for a St. Patrick's Day show. I, I'm just saying, just let's let's keep an eye on this because we might be being quietly phased out of the company. Oh, I see. Using COVID as a kind of a shield, the shield using a shield to shield us from the reality that we're soon to be. It is. Unemployed. It's a complex plan that you're suggesting, um, but those cut those types of plans do exist in our society. And you're you're sort of saying that we went. We created, not we, but the powers that be created an incredible distraction by putting the world into a pandemic scenario <laughs> simply to close offices um, globally, but the target being to remove um, our small group from the NFL media office. Now, I didn't look at it that way, you but took I it, really You took like it to that. the Sessler. Yeah, that was a Sessler level here. I, I could imagine a scenario where... Like we we just keep taping these shows remotely and we think we're putting them up, but actually, yeah, we ha- <laughs> like the the checks start co- stop coming and they stop going out. I don't know, and, and they, we're not even aware of it. And they're paying Erica like seventy five dollars <laughs> extra a month not to tell us. And we find out that like Mister F is a bot. Like anyone responding to um, our shows on Twitter and on and through various platforms are simply you know computer creations for the they were real people, but they've all been they were actors. So. It's, what do they call you know, it it's, when there's like an alternate reality that's created and you're not aware that you're a part of it? An alternate that, reality. A sim- we're, we're in a simulation. A simulation. Yeah. yeah. A sim. Mark's, Mark's fantasy. Basically what Mark <laughs> it assumes we're in at all times. And, is, and lately, you know, the last year has kind of like proved him like he might be onto something. And then my secondary point is, um, and yes, it's very important to be vaccinated i hope everyone's doing that it's it's good for the world and good for our country um and being safe uh, but i came very close today to starting the show without pants on and i noticed that right before we started and i ran and i put on some shorts and when when we're at a point where first of all i guess it shows that i'm comfortable with you guys and that's cool but when we get to the point where i'm sitting in front of two laptops lights microphones um and i'm in boxer shorts it's it's time it's time and I'll end it right there. I, I agree with you. I um, well, I know. Well, I know you. T- like I know you how guys... YouTube feel, and so I know what will happen to me. Mark will just be tugged to the next phase with no say at all. So it's like, <laughs> what? What? My this is basically the last eleven years. Just agree, <laughs> just go along with it, because I have no say. I actually am wearing a bathing suit with a blue and um, white flower printed all over it. Um, feel great. Um, prove it. Why? Prove it. Stand prove up. It, prove Stand it. Up. Prove it. Stand up. Speedo. Speedo. Wait. Oh. Uh, he is. He's telling the yeah, truth. Yeah. Wow. And it is a speedo, and there's not a lot left. To <laughs> it is not a speedo. <laughs> that we don't need. What's up with all you Europeans out there? The listenership still doing the speedo thing. Let's let's get it a little more baggy. Let's let's leave more to the imagination when you're at the beaches. <laughs> that's a course correction that's needed. You're, you're right about that. Why is that? How did that come out of the '70s? I don't know. Still intact. Right. Okay. So good stuff. Good conversation. Good bruise. 
No Bruce. Bruce soon. When we have some time off, that's not here yet. Um, today's show is glossary of terms. And I was going to say the off season edition, but it's not quite the off season anymore. Um, Greg, you're good at this. You're, you always hop in all the internal conference calls to show your face and make quiet connections with uh, shadowy league figures. What, what do you I call this do portion of the league <laughs> calendar right now? Like how do, how do we define it? This is absolutely the off season. It is the off season, what, what, even what when workouts, it it's a new league year. I mean, you could call it OTAs, you know, OTAs and mini camps. But yeah, this is the off season. This is like the heart of it. Okay. May to, May to July. They're going to get rid of that, though. They're going to figure out a way. They're working <laughs> on it already. Um, all right. So this is the off season. So it's the off season glossary of terms. So we're going to go A through Z. Uh, just touching on everything in the NFL galaxy. Um, and we'll take turns with the letters and, uh, anybody have any questions? I feel like we're all on the same page with this, right? Yeah. I, I always assume that well, we'll I probably see. did I it entirely wrong, but right. Uh, we didn't totally, um, talk it out ahead of time. So I'm looking forward we'll just to jump seeing in. how we all yeah. interpreted it. Should be fun. Should be fun. All right. We'll start with Greg Rosenthal, the letter a NFL all right. glossary of terms. All right. My, um, my term, uh, for the letter a is apoplectic. Um, which is a word that will describe Mark Sessler on the night of September 12th in our new podcast studio as we watch Andy Dalton start at quarterback for the Bears against the Rams. Oh, so you think it's happening. What are you, what's out there? What are the Sparrows <laughs> slash um, aggregated reports slash beat reporters telling you right now, Greg, when you read? Uh, well, uh, that, you know, that word also, it means like extremely angry and furious, which is definitely, um, as we already heard, maybe going to be Mark's... Um, feeling about going back to the studio in general it's not sparrows it's matt Nagy. it's saying uh andy dalton will be our starter that it was my instinct from the beginning and i don't think what he said uh, last weekend um was that important uh but i still believe they're gonna give dalton a chance because they'll look at the two of them and they'll see if they can just get by with dalton for a few weeks and almost feel like they owe it to him except that we're ignoring like what happened like so many preseasons blow these mid-May comments to bits. I mean, if Andy Dalton is Andy Dalton, functional, um, low ceiling, but certainly the capable starter, and Justin Fields is like getting the crowd going and doing electric things, like, okay, we can say whatever we want, but he he's going to start way sooner than later. Hopefully. The oh, only yeah. way, yeah, the only way Fields doesn't start week one, because it's not just about energizing the fan base and giving your chance a, uh, a better chance to win, giving your team a better chance to win. Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace are trying to save their jobs. And I, I feel like anything that's uh, that has Andy Dalton behind quarterback, that's a sign to me that Justin Fields' summer didn't go so well, which is something we can't predict right now. You're tell Honestly, Greg, you're telling me that if Justin Fields holds his own throughout training camp, uh, does really positive things in the two preseason games. They're going to say Andy Dalton is on the field. It happens all the time. This is a guy that, to. you know, they did trade up for him, but he was ultimately the fourth quarterback taken. It happens all the time for a week or two, you know, a couple of weeks. I just, I just can imagine this week one scenario, you know, luck. we will be taping the pod maybe during that time, but like of all of America being annoyed by the bears. Yeah. yeah. Here's the Matt Nagy. Um, logic at play which would be terrible but we love this kid uh we don't want to put him in a too tough a spot in his nfl debut so prime time sunday night week one let's get him out of there even as soon as you got week two home against cincinnati but, that's but then if it's I'd like if you're gonna start in week put... two just start him week one i don't know i, I think he's on the field that might I be do, a sandwich i problem. would like to see andy dalton have at least a drive in that cincinnati game um if they're up where he just rips down the field and shreds the Bengals to pieces. It, it is interesting too, because Cincinnati is filled with Justin Fields fans, you know? Um, mm. So either, either they're going to be rooting on, you know, like our, our friend Phil Wesseling um, who joined the podcast um, to his brother, Nick's dismay, uh, you know, like there's going to, they're either going to be like rooting for Andy Dalton to die, or they could possibly be rooting against like, you know, rooting and seeing Justin Fields, uh, slash their team, which would also be painful. Very Bengals. I'm looking at the schedule again here at LA home Cincy at Cleveland. Um, so maybe if you want to ease 
ease them in week four home against the lions week five on the road against the terrible Raiders defense. Maybe that's, I don't know. I hope week that's one. how it plays out. All right. Up next, the letter B Mark Sessler. All right. B is for um, Baker and the Browns. Mm. Will they live up to the hype or do they only operate when pandemic spreads? Was it all a hoax? Now that we all have microchips in our arms, will someone flip a switch that turns us all into nuclear winter zombies in week 10 and none of this will matter? Game Pass becomes a memory. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. It's it's an interesting glossary here because it's, it's, you know, um, usually it defines words. And here it's sort of like it's a question asking glossary, like questioning the meaning of these words. The assumption that any of us, yeah, put that together I, I certainly didn't i just said letter thing to talk about didn't go any deeper than that you know right. mark your your baker i understand where you're coming from we did a show a couple weeks back where it was around the afc and patrick claybon uh had the browns when we hit the afc north and he kind of put a question out there um about essentially not calling baker out but basically putting it out there is baker is he the guy here? Is he still the right guy here? And some, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that is a conversation that's still being had. I, the only, the only, I think, blemish to me on his 2020 season, which was other, otherwise great. Um, I really wish he would have taken him down the field against that beat up Chiefs team and won that game. The, the three and out and the punt was a bit of a bummer because it was all there. All the momentum was there for the Browns to pull off that upset and be in the AFC championship game. But that's just one drive, and I'm not going to. Uh, and played in, in a drive in this in what I thought was maybe his finest moment. I mean, he played great that week. I mean, he played great that game. He, he you know, it is a little lost that he was going toe to toe with Patrick Mahomes. And yeah, Henny came in and that obviously helped. And they were it was an uphill battle, but he made a lot of special throws in, in down the stretch and, and especially in the two playoff games. Uh, so I think it, for Baker fans, it was nice for him to play the, his best when it mattered the most. I thought. I think though, if you, if, if, if that 2019 season had been replaced by, you know, one that built on his rookie year. And I think we forget his numbers in his rookie year where he didn't even start the season were pretty remarkable. He shattered the touchdown record, which, you know, happened again with Justin Herbert probably will happen every year, but I mean, the 2019 season, things went so south, and I think it was the off the field, everything. Right now, he's like at home in Austin doing puzzles. Um, I'm watching his wife's Instagram stories, and he's like home puzzling. So this is not some guy, some malcontent that's an issue. He was a hard worker, and if he can build off last year, then like maybe some of the, the questioners will stop questioning. Do you buy into what someone posts on their Instagram is the exact thing they're actually doing in their private life? Yes, I do. With no questions asked. <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't. I need some backstory here. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, speaking of Instagram, <laughs> uh, we are at nineteen point nine thousand people on the gram. We're just shy of twenty k. So please, the ATN podcast. What was your confusion, Greg? I, I I misunderstood your bit, your joke. I got it now. I got it now. It was a Greg question. also doesn't you look at people's Instagram yeah. stories because he finds that to be invasive according to past comments he's made. So Wait, I who? do I, you, <laughs> I, I don't look at them because I think they're invasive. You, you made some sort of comment about uh, um, along those lines in the uh, past, which I, I think logged. it was more. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I don't desire to, but it's not because I found it invasive. It's just like a lot of, you know, for the most part, it's people you don't want to know about their lives. You know, there are, there are some exceptions, but good thing is you get to choose who you <laughs> click in with that particular app get us to 20k everybody we love you and also get us to london if you can hashtag get atn to london all right c uh for c y a which also means cover your ass which is teddy bridgewater and we're jamming him into another show you know <laughs> it's funny greg it's got, I'm, I'm tired of it now. i thought you were going you thought you were going to avoid this you looked at the week of, of shows and you said okay teddy bad mouth his old coaching staff on the way out the door and it fell after our podcast on Wednesday, and then we had a network show Friday, and then a weekend, and we did talk maybe, about it on the network show. Yeah, maybe this will uh, sneak through, but no, this is something we should talk about with our pod- podcast audience. Uh, here's what Teddy said on Patrick Peterson's podcast: One thing we didn't do much of when when I was there, we didn't practice two minute really. We didn't practice red zone. You walk through the red zone stuff, and then Saturday you come out and practice red zone, but you'd only get like 15 live reps. Guys' reps would be limited. 
Matt Rule responded. He was disappointed. Um, I love this because Mark Sessler loves Matt Rule as much as his own sons. Greg has lost any ability to properly analyze Teddy Bridgewater because he's so deeply in love. And now these two men hate each other. Wait, you're the one that that was so fired up about this sending like, give me a over text, like, give me a break with this guy. Who does he think he is? Well, I, that's what I I totally think that I think it's a terrible right. job by Teddy for for to say anything on the way out the door just because he's doing a podcast with another player to, to be negative, not and not having the savviness to understand that that was going to blow up as a story. I, I was disappointed that Teddy, who, who otherwise has a sterling reputation, uh, made those comments public because ultimately all it does is cover up for the fact that he was an absolute disaster uh, in the red zone and in close when the game was on the line. And now he's giving interviews a couple months after the season and, and saying, oh, by the way, uh, the coaching stunk in those situations. Uh, yeah, but we, for those we're situations. doing like the sports radio thing where you take out a minute of a 40 minute conversation. I listen to it because I love Teddy. It's one of the reasons I'm a fan like of him as a person. Wait, you're a fan? Yeah, he's smart, and I like his perspective. I think, first of all, he prefaced that with about two minutes of saying all the things that he did wrong, that he told them he was a big boy. He kind of knew he was going to get dumped after that season, and he totally understood it. And then I think also, like, what do we want out of our athletes? Do we want them to just be honest and have real honest conversations like they would have with each other? Because the reaction they had in the you know, immediate thing to him saying this. And basically every other player's reaction that's heard this is like, what? And I think about the Panthers off season last year where they talked about how they wanted to practice a little differently um, and on different days than other NFL teams. And different teams have done this too. The Ram the Rams are certainly one of them. I don't know what they do with red zone. And he was just being real. And it was in, it was in a 40 minute, like free flowing conversation where he was extremely, um, complimentary of the Panthers in many spots and took a lot of ownership, but he, he noted something that reporters or that players maybe wouldn't, you know, feel comfortable to say, but that is absolutely interesting. <laughs> like if they, if Carry they're de-emphasizing, if they're de-emphasizing red zone and situational play, which is something that basically the Patriots and different teams spend multiple days on with their live reps and is the only thing that they truly practice. Like, I want to know that. And I do think that's interesting to learn. And I wouldn't be surprised if coaches all the time, you know, tweak and figure out things when they come to the NFL from the college game of what they need to do better. So it it feels like a little bit of a cheap thing to just like take these yeah. little Well hold hold on hold on, these hold on. Like, hold, wait a minute back the bus up just a few yeah. feet please because no, number one no matter what we're, like if we just cut the conversation there it's Teddy Bridgewater's great he's interesting he's intellectually stimulating those are all nice things but like why if you're the quarterback of the team and if all these other players if you're saying all these other players understandably would be like why are we not practicing this did I mean, Teddy Bridgewater it. take it to the? Hold on, did, hold on. Did Teddy Bridgewater take it to the coaching staff, or did he did, did he stay silent when he would love to? You know, it's a new, it's a first time NFL coordinator. What if he did? What if he did? You wouldn't know. Are they going to listen to him? Are they... What's to say they wouldn't listen to him? I mean, like when we talk with Matt Rule, he had nothing but ultra respect for Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, you know, and there was clear admiration. It's not just some foot soldier you're not going to listen to on any level, like. Why not raise that complaint um, when you come out of week two or three realizing the red zone offense is half broken? My, you're my telling point Patrick is like, Peterson we're all, adult, in May. we're all adults here. Like, can't we be big boys and like speak honestly about things? He wasn't being personal. He was talking about something. But and everyone be, Greg, in the sports just, media just who's not there says gets something. their... Right, Why not be an adult up, with the Greg, coaching just, staff? What just do you, because somebody right, says something he on a podcast doesn't mean right. that it's truth. It's his side of the story. And you're just taking what he says and just running with it and saying everyone else is a child for having anything critical to say about your boy. That's not I it just, at all. I'm saying perspective. Like, I don't think he thought it was like the biggest deal in the world. I don't think Matt Rule did either. They're like grown men who are just talking about their profession in ways that we do too. Oh, after I'm the sure fact. Matt like, Rule was, it rolled right off his back, right? Like, do sure. we, do we, we go? to our producers with every complaint that we have when we're talking amongst ourselves or whatever and, and take full responsibility. I, I do think the context of how he said it with the preface and everything else really does make a difference because he was just being real and like having a conversation. Well, it, and what, he, what but, he made a mistake doing was assuming that like it wouldn't become a story and that he was just having a conversation and that you should always kind of pussyfoot around and not really speak honestly in no, media see, settings. The, the way you're wording it, I see what you're doing, but it's like you brought up 
our show and our producers, we do have issues sometimes with our producers. Right. And if they're actual issues, it's never something we say into a microphone. We talk about it privately. Like right. I don't, I don't know. It's, it just smacked well, to me as uh, you're making excuses. We wouldn't go on another excuses. podcast flaming our producers. And then Greg's like, well, we're all just being adults and out in the open. It's like, actually, that would be a terrible <laughs> thing to do to the people that you work I, with. But you the know? point is, I'm, I'm saying it wasn't flaming. If I, I honestly believe if Matt Rule like listened to it, and maybe he did, he wouldn't like they, they're going to be like annoyed by this. But like of all the things, I'm sure they did have many conversations that were much more like he, it's like like if you're a grown like but adult. you're putting your the way you look at things onto Matt Rule. And right. Saying so that, we're yeah, not grown adults, but you are. No, I'm not saying that. I'm let's, saying let's keep like, moving, boys. I don't think it's like <laughs> I don't think it's something that Matt Rule is up at night worrying that we're slamming him. I think the sports media probably was a lot more upset about it than what letter than, are we on? Matt Rule we're we're, we're on letter D, Greg. <laughs> All right. Donuts. Um, donuts uh, are one of the many foodstuffs the Eagles would trade Zach Ertz for right now. It's donuts. <laughs> it's I like, think you're right. <laughs> Mark, you you uh, lost a sandwich prop, so not a donut, but a sandwich. Uh, with your you led our sandwich prop uh, segment with the draft on a Zach Ertz trade bomb. Still hasn't happened. I guess nobody wants him, Greg. Yeah, I mean he had a tough season. I think they're hoping that something happens. He is holding out, of, or quote unquote, it's not holding out. I shouldn't use that term. It's all voluntary. Um, he is not going to the voluntary workouts with the Eagles, which is not a surprise. But about 80, 90 percent of most of the teams that started him did show up. So the whole like voluntarily opting out of the offseason thing is not working for the NFLPA. Uh, but Ertz is an exception. I think they're hoping something happens in camp where someone like gives up a fifth round trade swap. But between his his production and his salary, I can't see there me being much I interest. Could, you know, if, uh, maybe Jacksonville, like you know, pre Tim Tebow, they Indy, were burning for Indy for tight nothing. End like yep. Indy has plenty of cap space. They could. I would think maybe he'll end up there. I kind of doubt well, it. Well, someone and, like Reich really. knows Ertz, and you knew him at a better time. And I think Ertz was banged up last year in ways that we just, you know, oh, oh he's got this injury. He just did not look healthy to me in a bad offense. All right, the letter E, Mark. All right, the letter E is for Erica, a.k.a. Ricky Hollywood, who will file our E entry by proxy if she hasn't drifted off to sleep. Oh, there she is. E is for Etienne, the Jaguar's second pick in the NFL draft. He did all his work at wide receiver in his first mini camp this week. And did you know that he was used heavily as a receiver at Clemson with who? Which quarterback? Trevor Lawrence, the now QB for the Jags. The letter E. And well, also, you, Ricky. also E for England, which is in the UK. And I need to apologize to many of the Irish listeners who are very, very upset that I included it when I said the UK. I misspoke. I said when we were over there, because it's so easy and quick, it's the same thing of going from New England, you know, into New York. While we're right over there, I want to go to Ireland as right. well. So I apologize. I know that Ireland is not part of the UK. A lot of history there. A we can shove history. anything we want into these the entries. History you is see. rich. Very flexible. The history <laughs> is indeed rich, Ricky. Um, but thank you for um, coming clean on that. And also, yes, uh, I don't know. Do you guys put anything into Etienne, uh, the team of Etienne? Um, playing wide receiver at all or is this just urban Meyer and people getting excited about a new era of Jaguars football I thought Meyer was basically saying let's use this extra time that we have with these rookies to get him um you know practice at a position that he typically wouldn't always be at uh I mean look they or he he's urban Meyer is already on the radar of so many fantasy people because the first comment was We've drafted this guy in the, you know, in the high up in the first round, and we're going to be a committee backfield with a bunch of jabronis and Travis Etienne. And then now he's playing wide receiver. I think you've got these people trying to draft for dynasty scenarios um, with their hair on fire and probably avoiding them altogether. But, you know, if he can play, he's going to play a little bit of everything. And like, I like a running back they can use versatility. I mean, I don't have a, I'm not sitting up at night worrying about it. Are you, Greg? It's also like, what what are they doing? What, what what running are they practicing at rookie mini camps? But what what right. anything are you practicing? I I the people that actually go to these things that I trust and read about almost all uniformly said they learned their lessons over ten years that there is virtually nothing you can take from these mini camps. Like Jamarcus Russell looked like the best player ever. Other guys have looked terrible, and other than like injuries and just little positional things like this, I don't I don't think there's any anything you can take that has too much meaning. 
you bring up Jamarcus Russell and you know we're coming off a year where Isaiah Wilson uh first round pick of the Titans out of football now one of the great busts ever but to me Russell's still the biggest one ever and still the best story is when they gave him a, a CD and said this is the playbook and then he came back to the the campus or to camp and they asked him about the playbook and he said oh yeah yeah it looks good I'm I'm, I'm ready and they had nothing on the CD so they were just testing him because I guess they had some concerns about whether he was doing his homework his, his diligence <laughs> that does it's the come old, up uh... on our podcast once a year I like that one it, <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me um uh, uh, something similar just made me think that there was a story this weekend how Jed York even the owner of the 49ers thought that John Lynch, he, he, if he had to guess, he thought they were taking Mac Jones. And it got me thinking, I think they pulled like a Jamarcus Russell thing on Jed York. It's like, uh, wow. there's a little bit of a reason here. Like there was no leaks and no one knew what was going on. Like they kept, they kept that close. That was my reading between the lines of like, let's make sure this not gets out. This doesn't get out. Let's not tell uh, ownership. The letter F is for fried squirrel. Um, uh -oh. Ravens rookie guard Ben Cleveland at the combine a reporter asked him he looked a little trimmer than the last time he was seen in public and he called it um, part of his squirrel diet and uh, of course people go crazy about that because you know first of all eating squirrel that's pretty hardcore uh, he's an avid hunter he, he hunts all type of game and eats all different things but he said he clarified his comments and um, said that you know I don't eat squirrel exclusively, but if I'm hungry and uh, I have to dig around in the deep freeze, if I find a squirrel in there, I'll, you know, defrost it and chow down on it. Um, I have a, a, a couple thoughts, but first, if you've ever been curious, because I certainly was, and you know I have a relationship with squirrels now after right, what right. happened in the pandemic at my previous residence, uh, what does squirrel taste like? Uh, here's what Cleveland had to say. I mean, it tastes... Uh... It tastes like squirrel. I mean, I don't know how to explain it to you. <laughs> I would imagine a nutty flavor. No, not really. Um, what? Now, some some squirrels, like down south, they'll taste like in South Georgia, they'll taste a little bit more nutty. But I mean, up here, they are are like acorns and stuff like that. They're not really as strong as the ones down south. So, you know, most most of them up here, they. I mean, it tastes like squirrel. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, you, I mean, you put enough you put enough seasoning on it, you can make it taste like whatever you want it to taste like. But I should say that was from the Baltimore Ravens The Lounge podcast. You know, it. Is, I guess I don't know, man. I I don't think any of us. I actually know none of us are hunters, but I know there's a whole cross section of our country that is. Um, but it just reminds me, when you hear a guy like that, you see a guy like that, and you see what he's talking about. An NFL locker room is an interesting place. It's got a whole lot of things going on in it. Yeah, I mean, yes, the, like there the, are actually different levels of men than you would probably find on like an NFL podcast for the most part. Um, and I would just say, you know, your city squirrels, Dan, are probably safe. I don't think those are the squirrels that you hunt and eat. They probably not as would nutty, taste, no. They would taste like, you know, zinc and like car <laughs> pieces. And but like if you're if you're in the deep woods, um, I would imagine. You, and I don't even. I wouldn't even choose to eat it. But you could cook up a squirrel with some spices and some side foods and make it taste that's what survivable. he said he's yeah. a survivalist mm -hmm. offensive, line, anything? offensive line definitely gets a different type of guy than let's say like the edge rushers like i don't right. you know it's a different it's it's often uh it's a very different group i do like it is i do think about when it comes to eating animals like the more because everyone sound you know sounds grossed out by eating a squirrel and you know that's probably my first reaction too but it's like once you get past the like the moral part of eating any animal, it's almost saying like one animal is better than the other as as like a bean if you would like eat one but not the other, which I always seemed like a, a moral quandary. I think people step into. Well, you it's certainly opened up a conversation piece. Um. <laughs> it's, it's like once I'm gonna eat one animal, it's like I, I guess. What's I'm fine the weirdest thing you any, ever ate? In, like, eating uh, any meat wise. Ah. Well, the most regular thing, I've been ordering this yak chili from uh, Tara's Himalayan Cuisine about w w ah! once every three weeks during the pandemic. It is delicious. Uh, and that's pretty That's pretty weird. Gamey? Gamey a little bit? Yeah. It's, thin, it's tasty, really. That's yeah. Gamey? Really Why bad. would ga gamey and no, tasty gamey. don't sound not like gamey. something just, you'd That's usually what people say when you hear that. Um, it's kind of like, uh, have you ever had a like 
buffalo meat or whatever. It's kind of like that. I think. Yeah. I had some alligator down in Nolens. That was pretty What does hardcore. that taste like? Alligator. Chewy, yeah. Yeah, not something I would do again. How about you, Mark? I know in your past, maybe. No, I don't know. I can't. I couldn't. I'm not. I'm not going to like dazzle you on this on this front. I mean, I I still find it odd that like people put on top of pieces of oats, um, you know, like the the breast milk from a two thousand pound cow, and find that to be something that's right. normal. That's, what, that's I mean, where I'm getting at. Like yeah, everything once you is sort really of think about it, you, everything wanna, seems you know. a little crazy. Yeah, right. I do like when Mark starts talking food. It sounds like an alien talking about how humans act. <laughs> All right. Well, or the the letter. G, Greg. Uh, oh yeah. Well, I, you gotta go with the G man. <laughs> Thank you. Bro. Um, you know that's uh, it's a nickname. Wait, can I do it? Ooh, G man. <laughs> Feels good. Uh, that that is a nickname created uh, originally by Chris Berman and popularized by someone called the New Old Daddy <laughs> Zeuser. Uh, that uh, helps to make one of the most annually boring NFL teams sound more entertaining. That's, oh, what about this year? They got a little juice this yeah, year. Yeah, they possibly. seem like a little more fun. I was hopeful going into last year it didn't pan out. Um, it's It's been a long stretch where the Giants have been pretty yeah, boring. I would say New, New York, York also, needs something. I mean, the G- last four years of New York football is is uh, wildly terrible. Another G, though, is Gettleman, who I think you know at least changed some of the you know easy jokes around him at the draft by doing what no one thought he could do. And like their offense is interesting. I would be the most concerned about their offensive line. They didn't really add anyone. They had issues last year. Um, and you know, if you put Daniel Jones behind a line, that's not protecting him. Goodbye. I think, I think they will be fun to watch you. How are you, um, Dan thinking about the, the nickname, the new old daddy Zeuser, because you might have a branding <laughs> problem. You've got all these different nicknames and it's like, you need one to stick above the rest, but this, Sort of well, you're that. you're contributing to trying to muddle my brand, which I don't appreciate. But uh, <laughs> the new old blue eyes is something that's really taken off, and that's kind of grabbed the imagination of people, and that's cool with me. I, you know, this is not really my call. The old Zeuser, I think, is the standby. That's the one that's you know people know the most, and um, you know, Big Daddy Rich is also just in the mix, and that's out there, and some people like it, some people don't, but uh, it's really three. Three and I, counting. I think big, big Daddy, Daddy Rich. Rich is I didn't my even know preference. that it had a big in there. I, I don't think so. Maybe I added big, but it's it's Daddy Rich. <laughs> Daddy Rich. In honor of Chuck Daly. That was a Chris Wessling. Uh, he threw that one out there as an option. I always liked it. It just didn't take. Um, I'm sure Chuck Daly is honored to um, find out that you've gone in that direction. Chuck Daly's not honored about anything anymore, unfortunately. Oh. So a little bit awkward, but uh, we're going to okay. keep moving. Maybe his estate. His estate. The letter H, Mark Sessler. All right, H is for Harris Kamanaji, who was living <laughs> in a dorm room in Alabama six months ago, cooking top ramen noodle in a one-man hot pot, but now must save a Steelers attack that was essentially stuck in carbonite for most of last season. I mean, I don't actually think he was eating out of a hot pot in a dorm room, but I do think he's um, extremely important to this Steelers um, offense and there's definitely a a controversy among Pittsburgh fans who wanted them to go offensive line, um, not running back because running backs apparently don't have any more value than like a bag of salt right now to draft Knicks. But um, I love that they picked him up. I think it gives them some spice and they are going to have to be run heavy if Big Ben looks like he did down the stretch of last season. I maybe is is it a little bit underplayed to that point? Is a little bit underplayed that when they ran into their struggles, and remember they started eleven and zero, and then just went in the tank and got wiped out by the Browns in the playoffs. But like when that offense was sputtering, the fact that the running game was just stuck in mud all year, there was no, nothing explosive back there. Maybe they've they've diagnosed this, and this is going to be a huge lift if this guy is a big time player. He could have a a huge transformational effect on the offense potentially. It's more about the line, though. James Conner, you know, according to PFF's numbers, actually was was pretty good in terms of yards after contact. But I think he, among all running backs in the NFL, he was, like, hit behind the line of scrimmage more right. often. And almost right. every offensive line metric they had was a disaster. Now, they do – there there is a way you could squint and, and their offensive line could work out. It's very hard uh, to predict. I'm, I hate doing – you know, you guys always – you're like, 
tell me I'm a contrarian, which I didn't realize until you guys told me that, or you know, and uh, I don't like that. Wait, no um, one else ever said that to you before we started this podcast. No. Wow. So you just surrounded yourself with <laughs> yes men, essentially. No, because I don't, I don't think of it that way. It, I do get anxious though when there's too much of a consensus, and the fact that the the Steelers are like almost a touchdown underdog in Week One, and they're plus eight hundred to win the division. So put it this way. People think that the that the Eagles and Giants have about twice as good a chance to win their division as the Steelers do to possibly win. Like they are kind of being treated like like a below five hundred team, and I get and that that makes me a little. I do push back against that just because I'm I'm just gonna give Mike Tomlin and the organization the benefit of the doubt that that's not that likely to happen. It could I, happen, I, but it's I not become, that likely. I, become, I with you on that because I would say this, like I had my fun with the Steelers coming out of the, out of last year, just because it ended in spectacularly disastrous fashion. But there are those, those odds you mentioned are because the division right. they're in. If you put the Steelers in the NFC East, we're not having that conversation. Right, the but public secondly, is so out on them. I, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because ultimately do I think the Ravens and the Browns are better teams? Yeah, I do. But I, I'm just not... I'm not giving up on the Steelers mattering. I think I think they got a shot. Couldn't the Steelers finish one game behind Cleveland or one game ahead of Cleveland? We wouldn't be that surprised. I mean, right. realistically, exactly. I think that's exactly. what the re- the real environment is. Their schedule: first four weeks at Buffalo, home Raiders, home Bengals, at Green Bay. That's a nice. We're gonna get a nice little temperature check on where they are. Right, depending um, on who right Green Bay is. That. Right. Uh, well, assuming Aaron Rodgers is there, the letter I. Is that where we are? Yes. We got a ways to go here. <laughs> uh, Irvin, comma, Michael. Speaking of Aaron Rodgers, I, I could not let this get off our radar either. I, let's just listen to Irvin talking about Aaron Rodgers during the schedule release show last week. And I, I'm amazed this was on TV. Go ahead, Ricky. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the measuring sticks that I place upon people that I meet. When I'm engaging in any kind of conversation or business relationship, personal relationship, I, 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 I measure this. If you can fall out with your mama, with your mama, oh your mother, your mother, the, the woman that had to figure out what you wanted just from the noise that emanated from your body. Ah, he's crying. Oh, you hungry, baby? There you go. Ah, oh, you got a wet bike type Yeah. If you can cut off your mama, you definitely will cut off GMs on a football team. I'm just telling you right now. Um, wait, wait, hey, Ricky, I we don't need to hear the Aaron Rodgers part again where he goes into the mama. I just want to hear that set up again. I just want to try to process that before he goes into it. Play it one more time. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the measuring sticks that I place upon people that I meet. That's the most fascinating part of this. For Everything else is like uh, peak vintage. Uh, Michael Irvin is an awesome, crazy person. Um. <laughs> But I just like the idea that he prefaced it by saying that any relationship in his life, the measuring stick he uses about that person is, I guess he does some deep research and he finds out what the relationship between this person and their mother is. And then he's able to then um, proceed forward or repel against any type of relationship. That's fascinating for me. How does he do this research? How does he learn about the family structure um, these are all questions I have about Michael Irvin. It's a different way to go about your your business matters, um, personal matters. A with, measuring you know, stick. He didn't say the measuring stick. <laughs> you know, it's one well. of many one of many factors. Um, yeah, that was one one example of why Michael Irvin is great television, in my opinion, and uh, another example of why. And I wouldn't you know throw Irvin as the only one here that the conversation around this entire Aaron Rodgers. Uh, trade request uh, is getting problematic. You know, it's just it, no one knows what's inside this guy's head. And it, a lot of people are assuming a lot that they really don't know about who he is as a person. It's a tough thing to talk about because no one knows anything. Like, there's some bad. History. He's not the only that? one. I've, I've noticed some other bad um, coverage of this where it's just like people are just like assuming they know what he's thinking. You don't know. You don't I want to correct history. that by speaking. Like, right. could he clear that I'm up? I'm not saying Why it's not his bad. It's just like it's a tough spot for to talk about. I want an oral history on the pre-production meeting before that show. Like, so Michael Irvin said, guys, this is when I want to talk about Aaron Rodgers' relationship with his mom and why it, it says a lot about his relationship with the Packers. And nobody was like, hey, Mike, I don't know, man. I don't know. That feels really personal. We don't really know the situation there, do we, Mike? Maybe we don't go on TV with that one. <laughs> 
Well, he probably he probably dropped that like an A bomb from the sky. I'm sure they knew that was coming. Well, if you look at Kurt Warner's face in the background, right? <laughs> it might have been G. I mean J from G. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> gonna go Jugs Machine. Uh, this is a, a football throwing machine that helps athletes improve their ball skills. It is also notable. Uh, for having better chemistry with Odell Beckham than his actual quarterback, Baker Mayfield. Oh, look at <laughs> I that. did not see that sniper fire. Look oh, at that. Oh, Greggy. Well, All right, so Mark. what is, your, what is the, th- the thrust of it's your point, It's just a glossary. Greg? I just, you look at the end of the book about football, and here's the glossary, and, and you learn. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I, on one hand, I don't understand why they've had bad chemistry, and I don't fully, I, I tend to think the numbers that are better without Odell and with them are partially attributed to other factors and luck and just randomness. On the other hand, they don't have great chemistry. They have not maxed out Odell Beckham there. And that's really important. See, I I think like both things can be true. It it hasn't, they haven't maxed out the best Odell Beckham or the best uh, Browns offense with Baker and Odell. And that's important. Maybe it'll be not a non-story, but it's something to watch. I would argue that it's another topic. We're we're killing the Rodgers topic, understandably. That the are the Browns better without Odell Beckham has run its um, cycle yeah. as I well. I wouldn't go that where far, but they do it, need to have better better chemistry. I would never say they were better without him, but can't they but be they were, better though. together? But they were. And the other thing is, I think when when Odell Beckham is in there, it's Odell Beckham's offense from a where what what's the focal point? And when he's not in there, it becomes Baker Mayfield's offense. I mean, I could argue it's That's Nick Chubb's problem. offense, but. Something about um, the only thing I clung to a little bit, and it's hard to put numbers onto, just that I think when your quarterback becomes the alpha, um, things take on a different uh, look than when your alpha is a wide receiver. I I don't know. Like I, I've maybe heard a theory that, that like Baker's height is season. part of it. I've heard a theory that Baker's height, like that Eli, you know, served up these little slants over the middle, these short passes that Odell, you know, kind of these short passes that Odell can take a long way and. It's, a, it's been a little tougher to generate those in the Browns offense. And does that have to do with Baker's height? I don't know that who the heck knows. That's the thing is I, I have no idea why this is the case, but it's still something to watch. It's nebulous, but there's something about it that feels tangible. That's the closest we've ever come to an Eli Manning compliment from Greg on this podcast. <laughs> he oh was tall gosh. enough to throw slants to Odell Beck. Go watch Eli Manning in the 2011 season <laughs> down the stretch into the Super Bowl. He was performing like a top five quarterback who reminded, you know who he reminded me a little of? Is how Justin Herbert played last year. Obviously not the athleticism, but he was, inc- I, w- I want to just give some Eli compliments. Incredible <laughs> under pressure and hitting low percentage throws that you just could not believe where he had uh, the cojones of uh, of a superstar. So there, there you go, 2011. And that 2011 playoff, the throw to Mario Manningham was a yep, yep. a 99 percentile level throw in terms of skill level and difficulty. Um, I wonder if Odell, if they just had a disappointing season and maybe had another hamstring, uh, whether he would have been a more attractive trade option for Cleveland if they decided to go in another direction. But when you're coming off reconstructive knee surgery, that doesn't help in terms of evaluating whether he's a part of the team. But we're going to get another season of them together, so we'll see what happens. All right, next up is is it k with mark sessler yes k is for kyle pitts the hot lana fascination i can't wait to see him you know burning down the sideline on a 98 yard catch and run touchdown against the bucks while he's pointing the entire time at a bemused gronk on tampa sideline and you know while i say this to you a little man named barnsey tops is already in his studio working on a commissioned bust of pitts for canton it's all happening. He's already been put in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Greg, I've, well, you've been who, very who hot, that? Greg. <laughs> Barney. What was the name again? Barney Tops, the sculptor, works with bronze, metals, clays. <laughs> Barney Tops. <laughs> Barney Tops. Greg, you've been very hot on uh, various platforms about the Falcons uh, should not be in a rush to trade, uh, trade Julio Jones. Let's yeah. see this offense working together. I've got more coming in, in the dictionary too, but yeah. I, 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 I do in the projected starters series. They're out this week. They're starting to come out. I look at this Atlanta offense. You got to have some things go right. I, I think there's a chance they're a top five offense. So what are we doing here? 
You know, what are we doing? Uh, I'm with you on 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 Bronzy or Topsy. What's he doing? I, Barney, you know, Barney building a put the, him in the, the Hall Canton of Fame bust. Yeah, but yeah. Put Julio in the Hall of Fame. And oh, by the way, Calvin Ridley is one of the top 15 receivers in the league and is going to shred single coverage that he sees. And oh, by the way, Hayden Hurst is the best backup tight end now in the league. I like Hayden Hurst a lot. Justin Gage is a pretty good player. Like Arthur Smith, if he's a- as good as we think, man, this is a fun team. It's a fun team. I know you can't learn everything just by looking at numbers, but go look at Calvin Ridley's numbers since he came into the league. That dude, balls, and he's just entering his prime. Uh, The letter L, logos. All right, here, I have two things here. First, I'm going to just do a quick top five best logos. This is my list. Don't get mad at me. It's my opinion. You can't take it from me. Five, the Chargers, like the Bolt. Four, the Saints. Just feel, that's, I mean, that's New Orleans. What is it called, Greg, the Saints thing? Florida Lee. What is it? Floor de Lee. Ford Lee. Floor, Three Vikings. Floor de Lee. Well, it was Floor created before the Saints, but yes. Uh, right, but that's what it is. Yeah. Three Vikings. Love the Viking. Love that dude. Two, the Cowboys. Just classic. It's America. And one, the Raiders. But, so that's my list. Now I want to seg from logos to mascots. Kind of cheating, but whatever. Uh, On Reddit, there is a poster called L hashtag Machilero. So I want to give him credit. Um, Let's go through it. 14 animals for mascots. Five birds. Three are are carnivorous. One omnivore. One vegetarian. Nine mammals. There are four cats, two horses, one sheep, one aquatic mammal, one bear. Twelve humans. Five occupations. Chief, cowboy, packing plant employee, which is awesome. Steel worker, gold miner. One geographic, Texan. One religious, Greg Saints. Two historic, Patriot Viking. Two pirates, of course, Bucks and Raiders. There are two fictional creatures, a giant and a titan. Two machines, a jet and a charger. Three abstract concepts. And isn't it fitting, Mark, that the color brown? You're an abstract concept of a man, Mark. Um, (laughs) A football team. The Washington football team, abstract concept. The identity of a person named Bill, the Buffalo Bills. Smallest by weight, Cardinals. Largest by weight, Titan, Greek god, or the moon of Saturn. Edible, 28. Non-edible, 4. Can a single adult human kill it with bare hands alone? Yes, 16. No, 16. Wait, non-edible, 4? Only 4. Does that mean the the humans are edible? Sure. Because there were more humans. I mean, a giant can eat a human, though. That happened all the time. Humans, it's it, human history, and uh, there's there is cannibalism. That's a real right. thing. Go eat, go eat, go eat a Viking for bref- breakfast. Uh, Can it kill an adult human? Yes, twenty five. Assuming a very high voltage charger. Most expensive, a jet. Least expensive, a charger. Double A battery charger under ten bucks on Amazon. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. But well, just wait, good knowledge. The heaviest uh, was awarded to Titan. Heaviest the largest human, by I'm weight assuming? is a Titan. I mean, yeah, more, more than a jet. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the he's a giant, giant ass. Dude. All right. Well, I don't know how what what where he's getting his Titan measurables from, but I I will say I, I believe I always knew thought that the Browns were named after Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber. Uh, it was a contest. Um, others say Paul Brown, so I don't know about nebulous um, or whatever they said vague concept, but um, I love the list. It is, a, it is though because there was a lot of mystery to it. I, I really think it was. Paul Brown naming it after himself, and then he was just always super coy about it. And then at the end of his life, he was kind of like, "Yeah, maybe there." But it was some a contest, reporting. but but right, I, maybe he to steered that. it in a certain direction. Yeah, I mean, all right, let's. That was move good on. info. That was good info. Thank you. The letter M. I don't think Greg. the Chargers are going for like phone charger, but I, I understand that concept too. Like the M. the Los Angeles phone chargers. I mean that that is um, <laughs> hey, listen, contemporary. Bro, take it up really, with L underscore really it is. underscore Machilero. Okay. okay. Well, it, we're on we're on the topic, by the way. Here, uh, we, we just talked a little Falcon. So M is for Matty Ice, aka Matt Ryan, aka the Vanilla Assassin. Uh, this Falcons quarterback is uh, my favorite pick as the best sneaky long shot to win the 2021 MVP. You know, so so if uh, if you were looking at those, well, long 26 shot touchdowns lists, and 12 interceptions is going to do it. Then, no, uh, that's yeah, not going to do it. it. But that was MVP. that was where I was getting at with these weapons here: Pitts, <laughs> Julio, Ridley, Hurst. I like Gage. They actually have some um, 
high draft picks on their offensive line. They've been average, but I think Arthur Smith is their biggest addition for the offensive line. If everything goes right, they could be a top three or four offense. That's all I'm saying. So sneaky all right, MVP. You ready, candidate. Greg? Because I know you're excited about these Falcons. Another reason why we should go over to London and see Jets v Falcons at the big tot, um, the hot toddy. Um, I'm going to set the over under at uh, nine and a half wins. I'll go. I mean, if I was actually putting money down, I don't know if I would do this, but I'm going to predict they go 10 and seven. I just like their offense and that's, that's what I want to root for. Their I mean, defense don't you have to like, go 10 and seven, like, Greg, for him right. to win MVP? Right. That's yeah. a good call. So I'll go, I'll go over and um, their defense looks like a mess. I'm not saying that, but if you can somehow find your way to a top five offense, you'll, you'll, you know, Falcons fans know this. Sometimes it's not all about, you know, winning the Super Bowl. I, I oh. really do think oh. people are too. Oh, great. That's not what I meant. Greg, but Greg, Greg, Greg. Greg. I, I really by the way, do... you are be very careful here, Greg. You are a Patriot fan. Are you sure you want to be making this point right now? I think being a sports fan is more than just if your ta- team won the Super Bowl at the end of the season. I think Falcons fans would tell you when they look back at the Deion Sanders era, when they look back at the Michael Vick era, that those were like special teams that were entertaining and fun to watch, and they didn't end up getting getting anywhere and it's like that still brings a lot of value if you're telling me i gotta go pay tickets i want to go see 35 points a game and see a fun team uh, you know this team and it's not like you're closer to a super bowl by trading julio jones Ma- yeah maybe you'll take some you know mediocre second round quarterback just, with that it's pick. tricky like, big deal. especially you're the 28-3 team and it's there needs to right. be in my opinion as a sports fan um a look catharsis. at your knicks this year like you can have value Dude, in having some fun and watching a the fun Knicks team. The Knicks are a perfect example. The Knicks have not won an NBA title since 1973, I believe. And at some point, because I went through that in the 90s with the Knicks and into the 2000s, a lot of great teams, a lot of fun seasons, a lot of great memories of watching the games with my friends and families. You know, Allen Houston's roller against Miami, Larry Johnson's four point play, Patrick Ewing's put back to put them in the finals in 94. But at some point, you got to get over the hump and of you got to win one. And the of course, Falcons but what fans, does that have to they, do? In the meantime, let's be entertaining. I'm just saying, Falcons they're, they're fans obviously don't not going to win it this year regardless. Fan that winning a Super Bowl is not that important. That, that's, that was all and I that's saying, it's not so important. Greg, you're making not... the point that entertaining sports teams are more enjoyable than those that don't entertain. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. I'm saying there's a lot of that. value in sports of teams that don't win the Super Bowl. You're telling I me guess the, pack, the PSA like, uh, has What are we doing here then? It, We're all miserable. The, 31 out of 32 fan bases like thought that whole exercise was pointless every year. <laughs> no, but, no, it's, but the stupid. PSA is coming from someone whose team has won like a billion Super Bowls. If it was coming from someone that had never experienced that and was saying, look, I'm telling you, it's still so much fun, even though we've never, we're a Jets fan, we've never won the Super Bowl in my lifetime. I'm having a ball. It's all, all that matters is the fact that they're, you know, they're enter- entertaining me every Sunday vaguely. I mean, you have no to win a Super Bowl at some matters. point if you're going to follow a saying, team for There's 45 value. years. There's value to I it. I get what you're saying. Or else, what are we doing? You've just, if the whole point is Super Bowl or, or nothing, you've just wasted like 30 years, you know? It's a little bit rugged of a point to make about Falcons fans. That's all of them specifically that they you right. know just enjoy. I think it. just I think, sit back and enjoy it. But Falcons fans are loyal. Like they've been through it all, and I think I think they would I think they would agree with this on some level because they have had these really entertaining teams that have made impact. I would throw the the twenty eight three team unfortunately in there, um, like the Dion teams and Vic teams that you know they they had their moment. It was fun even if uh, they didn't win it all. Listen, you you didn't get that Super Bowl victory, but you had the too legit to quit era Falcon fans. So everything's fine. Dirty Birds, you know that was a fun <laughs> dance. Um, all right, uh, the letter O for Otani. Hit it, Ricky. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Shohei Otani, what can't he do? Shohei, showtime all the time. That's a 94 mile an hour fastball. Try to sneak it inside. Don't try to speak a fastball in against Shohei Otani. While, while we, as a sports culture right now, obsess about Aaron Rodgers' future, uh, even though there's nothing really to talk about, and, you know, whether the Charlotte Hornets or the Celtics make it out of the play-in or whatever the hell's going on with the NBA right now, like, there is a honest-to-goodness, amazing sports story going on in baseball right now. And I know baseball is 
not the national pastime that it used to be, but people should plug in if you're actually looking for a real sports story. Shohei Otani for the Anaheim or Los Angeles Angels is a pitcher and a hitter. And a pitcher who's pitching to an ERA near 2, 2.10. And he leads the majors in home runs after that one that he hit last night. This is an incredible story. People should pay attention to it because it's a Babe Ruth and 1927 type phenomenon going on. It's never happened. If you don't know baseball, you either hit or you pitch. You don't do both. You certainly don't do them at the highest levels of the sport. It did get me thinking as I transitioned away uh, from baseball to football, like what would the equivalent be in the NFL? And the only thing I could come up with is an ace pitcher is has equivalent to me the same or similar value to a quarterback and then a, a feared middle of the order slugger lefty slugger like Otani who hits the living daylights out of the ball is like a star cornerback uh so a a star quarterback and cornerback that plays two-way football that's Otani in baseball plug in America and maybe the world thoughts it's badass I mean it'd be like Chuck Benarek is sort of famous as the last true two-way NFL player. You know, back in the day, there most of the players were two-way players, and he did it at the highest level. He's a Hall of Famer. But that was what was that? You know, Sixty years ago. <laughs> it would it would be it would be wild. I do wonder if maybe we could we could uh, and you know find an athlete that would be good enough to even play offense and defense both at a at, at a high enough level. Like is football that specialized where it's that impossible? It doesn't seem that impossible to me. I guess it's just wear wear and tear on your body at like with the way how strong people are now. Would be I, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean football has just become so specialized because you do have that at the high school level. You have you have versions, little or versions right. at the college level, but that's just preparing certain players for the pros. I mean, I guess you're if you're looking for like the most versatile type weapon, we just talked about him. I would look at someone like Deion Sanders, but it's not the same as playing quarterback and cornerback. Like it's it, they just don't allow it in the I NFL. Mean, Troy I think that's Brown, one of the coolest things that's happened in baseball. Yeah, it is amazing. The closest thing we have in like the last fifteen years is like Troy Brown taking playoff snaps at cornerback. For the Patriots and Julian Edelman took some. Uh, they they didn't try to keep there long. Troy Brown did for like a, a a long stretch of a season for a playoff team, but that's you know nothing like the Otani thing is just like another. I wonder you it's wouldn't crazy. do it obviously also for health concerns. You would never if you had a star right. quarterback, you're not putting him playing him you know 80 snaps on the other side of the ball. So we're never going to see it happen. It's totally it's an apple and orange situation. But it just did get me thinking. Uh, the letter P, Greg. Ooh, how about the uh, the point after touchdown? That's um, you know the play where they snap the ball and they kick it through the up yeah. uh, th- It's a worthless play that should be abolished. That's that's the definition in the glossary right there. So lose it entirely. Get rid I of did it. not like the idea of pushing it back and making it harder because it's like, oh, let's make the kicker more it. important. Like I don't let's- need that. Uh, so if if that's if this is the way it is forever now, where you're losing games because the place kicker can't hit a 32 yarder or whatever it is, like yeah, all don't right. need it. You get seven points for the touchdown, and if you want, you can go for for an extra point that either adds one and makes it eight, you know, from the two yard line, what we call the two point conversion, or subtracts one if you don't get it and you end up with six. That's the oh. way to do it. Just stop wasting our time. I'm hooked on the fact that we skipped the letter N. <laughs> you know, the glossaries, you know. It's maybe we don't, maybe it's, maybe there is no letter N, but that's okay. All right, the letter N, Mark Sessler. Well, then I'm stuck going twice in a row, which is concerning. Just but, go, it's um, just go. I will go N is for Nelson, <laughs> comma, Quinton, the thick bully man who operates as the key to a cult's offense, offense, sorry, offense determined to keep Carson Wentz from walking into sacks and flicking absurd lobs to the opposite team. Carson's man crush on Quinton will grow weekly as the 330 pound ruddy faced man child blows up defenders and offers to crush Greg Rosenthal like a minuscule grape when said blogger fires shots at Wentz inside his week three debrief. 
Ooh, the debrief getting in the mix. Quinton <laughs> Nelson is—he is—he is, uh, is, he is a—he is not a—he's one of many NFL people I would not want to be on the wrong side of. I feel like he'd be high on that list. You're right. You would not. There's want a to upset there's him. a very short list of players that are in their 20s right now and are Hall of Famers. Um, like they have to maybe put together a few more years, but you just feel like it. All they have to do is stay healthy. Aaron Donald's there. Patrick Mahomes is there. I think we're getting to the point where Quentin Nelson on the offensive line is there too. So keep that in mind as you bury the Colts, America. I just want to fast forward to the season. Like we're going to bury the Colts so much by mid August. I'll actually flip around and then be high on the Colts. I don't, you oh, know, of course we will absolutely but start with, loving I, them. I don't know, you know. there's something, All right, Mark, there's since, something about it. Since we're already out of order and we're on the Colts, let me do R and then we're going to circle back to Q. All right. Okay. R. In cheating, what? Reich, we trust. Let's hear from Frank Reich, Ricky. Yeah, I just cringe when I hear stuff like that. Not that not that a player shouldn't be accountable for poor play on the field, and you know Carson has to answer to that, and he and he has answered to it. And um, and until you get out there and prove otherwise, that that's what you live that's what you live with. But um, you know, I, I just know that playing the position of quarterback, there's so many factors that go into it. We've talked a lot about why the poor play last year. Um, I'm just very confident that he has a team around him. And it's just, I think the culture fit. I, I'm, you know what? I've been on this uh, dancing around this, but I will, I'm officially going to be the guy in the show that I believe in Frank Reich and Reich. We trust he sees something in Carson Wentz. He's succeeded with Wentz in the past. And I think Wentz is going to work in Indianapolis. And a big part of what part of it is Frank Reich. In Reich, we trust. Well, hold on. So, I mean, I there's no doubt in Frank Reich. I think he's a great coach, and I think they've got one of the better coach general manager combinations in the AFC, if not the NFL. I mean, and you can jump on the Carson Wentz thing. That's cool, but like, we all liked Carson Wentz for a stretch of time too. And last year's not entirely on him, but I thought he lost his way. Uh, it's not just the line, and just he had. I'm not arguing back, that. Right. Do, can, he, can he rebound? Sure. But I mean, like, I also feel like I'm cool just waiting to see it. I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, trumpet that it's going to happen because I think there are fair questions about him. And, I, and, and I, this is maybe a little too talk radio-y too, but there were whispers tracking Carson Wentz that he just did not fit in with NFL locker room types, that there were some problems there. And so, you know, it's a matter of play and a matter of maturity. And like it would be, he's he's a comeback player of the year candidate if he does what you say he's going to do. That's all you I'm get, saying. I mean, there's you're right. We have we can't say anything definitively until we see it. But this is what we do for a living. And I'm saying that I think that you're the on the Wentz talent's wagon. still there. Uh, I'm on the Wentz wagon. Given the talent is there, I don't think there were theories that. The injuries have sapped all of his physical ability. To me, that's all hogwash. I think he was a guy that lost his way mentally and things snowballed and the coaching there wasn't able to get him back on track in addition to his own personal struggles. Fresh start, reboot behind a really good offensive line and a coach he can trust that knows what he's doing. I just think it happens. But Dan, I but Dan, back. I like the one thing that we battled on during the season last year towards the end was that you were not very excited about blaming Doug Peterson either. So, I mean, maybe it was just a total breakdown. Maybe it's unfair to blame one person or even two people. I'm not like, necessarily blaming Doug Peterson because that's a tricky situation when your quarterback goes in the tank. I think he just needs a fresh start. I think it was just very messy the way things ended there. And maybe, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe everyone's right that this is not going to work. And well, what, he's I'm what, saying it's what is working, though? I'm saying I'm going to wait and see. It's a great landing spot. It's one of right. the better landing spots you could imagine for Carson Wentz. A lot of I think pessimism it, I think around it's the him, I best. Guess. I think that's the best, but I guess my question would be, what is what is working? I, I never was fully in on Wentz. I remember having this argument and being on the losing side of it when, when he was, you know, on his way to maybe winning the MVP because he was not that accurate. He's just not an accurate quarterback. He, he relies on his athleticism and, and physicality, and that, it, it's tough because I don't think he's quite there where he's like, you know, Lamar or Cam Newton in his prime, and you can win with just that. And... um like to me, winning would be he has to be better, like significantly better than Philip Rivers was last year. And to me, that's a high bar. If he slots in like a little, you know, around where Rivers was or maybe a little worse, like, okay, it wasn't like a disastrous move for the Colts, 
But that is that like a huge right. win? I, I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine that because I believe in Frank Reich so much that if I had to guess, I would put him like where he'd be a little worse than Philip Rivers was last year. But if that's your best case scenario, I'm sure the Colts believe that there is a much better scenario than that. And that's what I doubt. Okay. I think he'll be on the right side of the Dalton line uh, this season. A guy you could still build around. All right, Mark, let's go back to you, Q. Back to Q. Q is for Quiche. Um, you guys might be a little bit too young to remember the 1982 smash hit um, book that swept the nation, Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. It was a bit of a satire, but it kind of painted <laughs> um, satirical uh, essays about what masculinity really means, especially in America. But when I think of masculinity, <laughs> um, I think of Ron Rivera, obviously. I mean, A, former football player, big burly man, um, overcame cancer, is a someone that they brought to an organization that could not have been more troubled, um, that Greg disliked for roughly 30 years uh, with, with reason to. And he has turned it around rather quickly. And when I think of masculinity, I think of their defensive line. Um, and really, after, after shoring up their left tackle spot with Charles Leno, solid enough, um, their offensive line has become strong. And so they're a team that really is in the image of Ron Rivera, where you're going to be tough up front on both sides of the ball. And, you know, it's easy to look at Washington and say they didn't get a quarterback um, in the draft. But Ryan Fitzpatrick might be kind of perfect for this for a year, and they can get one down the road. And I look at them as the team in the NFC East, um, if the Cowboys aren't healed on defense as a total um, juggernaut in terms of their toughness. I don't mean that they're a 12-13 win team. I just think that last year was the first step. It's not the end. Um, it wasn't an aberration. I think they're going to grow more and more into what Ron Rivera wants, and they're not going to be the team that gets beat up on Sundays. They're going to be throwing the punches. And they weren't last last year either. I, right. I think you know. I think they're going to. I feel like they could be a nine and eight type team, and that might be enough to win the division. I think it's going to be sure. a tightly packed division, and I think you can make a case for any of the teams, honestly, in the NFC East. I, I guess I have a bit of a concern that that fits in this type of situation i don't know why it's nothing more than a hunch that that he could struggle but who knows maybe he'll just keep playing like he did the last couple of years i have no reason to say, think that he wouldn't and and they'll and they'll make p plays on offense but uh they'll be an interesting thing team to track for sure roster roster is great i mean ron rivera chose well not only did he get all this power and he's not the first coach to try to do this in washington so we'll see, but he inherited all those defensive linemen. You know, th there's a lot of talent on this roster. That's not like they brought in since Ron Rivera got there. They there were players there and they've done a really good job adding doing the projected starters thing. If, if P Fitzpatrick stays being a, like a mid-level starting quarterback, this, that's like a, they have a upside. I think that's even higher th than you said. I think they have like a 12, 12 win type upside. Whoa. I think it's good. I like the, the Rivera, wow. uh, the way you used him as like a man's man. He is kind of the, the equivalent to Mike Tomlin to me, a leader. Yeah. Everyone wants to play for him. Um, and I think brings stability and, and maybe right really r raises their floor, which we saw last year. I would say they did bring in one person in chase young, who is like the love child yep. of like Beyonce and Conan the Barbarian. I mean, right. he's like a tipping point guy for that defense. Good, he, good he, point. Yeah. Good point. Uh, S G. Oh, that's me again. Yeah. Oh wait. I don't know. The whole alphabet. Every time, is... every time yeah. you're confused and surprised. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go Seahawks defense, a once historic group, uh, that has now been mediocre for almost as long as it was historic. Hmm. Under the yeah. radar. I mean, they made, he made his reputation on defense, Pete Carroll. I went back and looked at the DVOA. They have not topped 14th in four seasons. Been in 14, and you know they were below average in three out of the four. So it's like, let's see it. It's it's been a while now. They're always like, oh, this isn't the Legion of Boom anymore. It's like it's been like five years since since that was the case. So I guess yeah, they're, they're the the case here. And they didn't have a first round pick this year or next year. Is they've had now a long enough time gestation period to build the next quality defense since the Legion of Boom, and they just didn't do it, which makes a bit of a liability, and it makes puts more pressure on the offense 
to to fire on all cylinders, which it doesn't always do. At least it didn't last season, and and that that cost them. Football's hard. It's like almost impossible to keep a defense. I'm not even totally blaming it. I mean, Belichick had a very similar career path where that was a historic Patriots defense for four or five years, and they've they've popped up here and there over the last fifteen. But it's like there's a reason why it's historic. Like usually, it's not. It's it's everything coming together. It's not just good coaching. I I don't. I think he's a good coach, but it has not come together, and that's that's the reason. That's the biggest reason I think Russell Wilson hasn't, you know, advanced further in the playoffs the last few years. I did find it interesting last week that Richard Sherman, or maybe it was two weeks ago, said that he would go back to Seattle. I mean, I get he's looking for work, so there's that part of it. But it was this whole like, hey, these players just don't believe in Pete Carroll's culture anymore. And well, what well, what happens to that if you go back? But um, he needs I, the a culture job. thing I and bought they, into. So. He needs a job and he would fit in right. well. They could use that, him. That's Give a him fact. a shot. <laughs> Give him a yeah. shot. And also, like, you know, didn't they go 12 and four last year? The culture can't be too rough. Exactly. No, the culture I think is good. It just uh, if they could one of these years suddenly spike up, they do have some talent this year, and suddenly spike up and get a top five or six defense, then that's the year I think you know they they can make it to the Super Bowl. All right, Mark, as we start to bring it in for a landing, the letter T. All right, T. T is for Trafalgar Square, um, in the city of Westminster in central London. All I want to know is if I and we um, are stepping foot in Trafalgar Square in the next calendar year, it confirms our wishes to be in London. We will be watching um, <laughs> probably the Jets and Falcons if we have our way. I just, you know, I'm, we're going to spice a little pit, few pitches in here in the middle of the show. I want it to happen. I want to be having um, cocktails with Handsome Hank and Neil Reynolds and talking to British fanatics. And if they don't send us, I will alert the company that I'm going to go anyways. I'll take a a seafaring boat and, you know, super dull week eight on my own and um, live in like Kate Winslet's flat with her drinking rich wines and eating meats. What's her, husband, what's her, what's her husband? What's her husband? I'll change gonna, everything. Blow what's her husband going to say about that? Not a factor. And Mark's wife. Um, you know, <laughs> a I got a call from a shadowy league figure on Saturday morning. I was in the middle of my son's little league game for which I'm an assistant coach. Um, for the team and uh he said hashtag he, i answered the phone he said hashtag get atn to culver city hashtag get atn to inglewood because that's the only places you're going referring to our former office and our future office no, no. <laughs> wait a very Which, high ranking official i will that, say this you, we can beep this out but was it was a yes okay to which well, i say hogwash we will not be denied. Shadowy League figures will listen to us because we will continue the fight to get back to London. We will charm the pants off these people if necessary. They might not even have pants on because they're working remotely, but we will work and do everything in our power on this side to get back to that side. And, and by the way, hashtag back to Culver City. You will have to kidnap me in the middle of the night in like a a sack and take me off and punch me out to get me to Culver City. I'll never step foot in that office ever again. <laughs> the letter U for, well, Ricky, play it. So what you're telling me is that UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are real. Bill, I think we're beyond that already. The government has already stated for the record that they're real. I'm not telling you that. The United States government is telling you that. 60 Minutes is one of the most respected um, news programs and journalistic beacons on television in America. And it's been that way for decades. Um, that gentleman um, is Luis Elizondo, uh, who spent 20 years running military intelligence operations worldwide. Uh, and then he eventually moved on to covering unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAPs, which is another kind of like the updated way of saying UFOs. And when this man, who's now a civilian, so he's out of it, but this stuff is declassified. And Mark, I'm talking to you, buddy. Right. This stuff is declassified. When this high-ranking former military um, personnel figure is on national television in prime time, on Sunday night, on CBS, on 60 Minutes, telling the American public there are UFOs out there. We don't know where they're coming from, if they're from this planet or another. 
but there is absolutely spacecraft that we cannot explain and we don't know what to do with when we do see it. That is kind of under the radar. I, I think it's um, because, first of all, this is this report, this interview mimics so many other reports that have been going on for a for years and years and years. But if you want to talk about like government reports and pilots, um, military pilots coming forward with stuff, this is not new, except it there has not been the tipping point, I think, where it's still seen as something other than an oddity. Even in that interview, if you listen to the whole thing, the 60 Minutes guy does the very normal things like, this just sounds absolutely crazy to comprehend. It's like, but it's not. Like, I'm kind of surprised that you're a newsman. Tra if you're open-minded and tracking, like, the swell of a story, this has been going on for a really long time. Um, and it, it's just that we, I think, live in such um, a period of mental frazzle, and the last year has been so crazy that it barely breaks headline stacks. Uh, but it's real. I, I don't think it's, you're not a loony bin to, to, to suggest that anymore because it's not coming from, you know, people on crack websites. It's coming from military and ex-military, and it has been for decades. There's another Navy pilot, um, a Navy crew, uh, no, excuse me, Air Force pilot, uh, where they saw a, uh, a vehicle or a unidentified object that looked like a Tic Tac that was moving almost at the speed of sound and had no propulsion mechanisms. They're locked radar on it. It went right up to him, disappeared. These things are saying, Craig, these things are being said matter of factly. What's going on now? It could be military intelligence from other countries in the world, China, Russia, whomever, that are spying on us off the coasts of our country. But what if it's not, Greg? I want your take. It's been a strong five years. I agree with everything uh, Mark was saying, that it's sort of been under underplayed um, in terms of like the news developments in this area. So I'm looking forward to... Uh, doing our UFO podcast when we're in our 70s, what rich oh, material yeah. we might have by <laughs> then. If, it, if it's pop, this much is popping up now, you know. I, I seriously, I recommend, look it up on YouTube. The whole um, segment of the 60 Minutes on UAPs is up. Check it out. V, Greg, is V. It? All right. Um, victory formation. This alignment, once uh, a game's outcome is in doubt, um, which should be executed by Tom Brady, uh, no less than 12 times before the end of the 2021 season. Mm. There's no excuses. All right, I, me... really, I really think this team, other than like injury catastrophe, there's no reason no, for them not to... Let me play Gregel's advocate here. Yeah. Is it perhaps too pat to... Gregel's advocate, that's pretty good. <laughs> Is it a little too pat for us to just pencil in uh, this team coming off a Super Bowl win... A lot of teams have struggled in the aftermath of that. I, I'm, I'm not even going to throw in that the quarterback's turning 44 this summer because that just seems absurd to to bang on that at this point. But it's true. Um, and say they're not going to encounter any of the turbulence that so often hits defending champs. I agree with you on the surface, but maybe we're going to like jinx this into existence, some type of bizarre 9-8 and eight, uh, breakdown for them. The you're right. We've watched the NFL enough to like know how possible that is. That that said, like the good teams lately have stayed pretty chalk. Like the ones at the you know at the beginning of the season that you thought were the very very best are, are usually there uh, at the end. I just other than injuries, and they were pretty lucky with injuries last year. So if they got hurt in the secondary, the offensive line, or certainly Brady, things that then all bets are off. But I don't know. I just don't see it. It's not just like. They bring all the starters back, but it's like, okay, you're you've got like OJ Howard and Gronk and Cameron Brait to choose from. You know, you've you're just got depth at all these positions. There's just there's no logical reason. I thought they were unlucky in the regular season last year to only win eleven games. It's not like they snuck into the playoffs in my mind. They were a pretty good team. Uh there's just not any logical reason. There's yeah, I would a lot just of say illogical like, reasons. The, I, I I think the idea that they'd win twelve games out of a seventeen game slate is not, a, I have no problem with that at all, 13, 14 even. But you just look at last year's Chiefs, that if one thing goes wrong, I mean, their goal is to go back to back, which hasn't happened for anyone but Brady since 2003, 2004. I mean, it's just nearly, it's a tall order, but I don't think they're going to fall off a cliff, especially if the Saints are the team that falls off a cliff in that division. Mm. 
All right, up next, W, Mark. W is for what? What do you charge Houston Texans fans for season tickets? Five cents? <laughs> 12 cents? 66 cents? Maybe 71? 82? 93 cents? One dollar and four cents? One dollar, 29 cents? It's getting up there. Find your price point, Easterby. It's a buyer's market. It's a tough sit. They're Houston. such good fans, too. I mean, I know there's a lot of great fan bases, but I don't think Houston gets mentioned early in that the second they came back as an expansion team they filled that place up it is a loud stadium i was there for the playoff win it it was like deafening and like they have loved their football whether they're bad or good and yeah this this offseason is testing them i i would be surprised like it wouldn't be surprising if they struggled to sell out and all that i mean i've said it before on the show i the houston astros what a disgrace that franchise what they did uh they cheated outright and shouldn't have been given uh the right to call themselves a world series champion but take that out of it otherwise the teams the sports town you go across the spectrum whether it's baseball um basketball football it's a great sports town and you just whether no matter what city it is like when a team really goes this deep into the darkness uh you Oof. just feel for the fans you that really just made do. me realize that the Rockets are the worst team in the NBA. They didn't end up winning uh, with that entire Daryl Morey Harden era, which was they got so close and were heartbreaking. And this Texans at the same time, and the shame of the Astros. It's a tough spot right now for Houston. It's tough. Well, and I mean, just like the older fans remember the Houston Oilers, and Chris Wrestling wrote the incredible "Love You Blue." I mean, that fan base in the old House of Pain. There was nothing like that in the NFL. That stadium was insane. And there is a lot of carryover to Texans fans today. And I, I right. just find it, I, Dan, you mentioned the fact that like the Texans fans, what, how can you take a stand? Um, it's hard to because it's like your team at the same time, but it is one of the more complex um, anxiety ridden uh, encounters between ownership and fans in the NFL today. There's nothing quite and as the Deshaun the Watson moment. thing, which is right. not on the team. It's this whole separate thing and it hangs over everything with that organization. All right. It hangs over the league. I, it, it's, yeah. been on, it's been on it my does, mind, yeah. too, that like we're just assuming that Deshaun Watson won't play in the NFL this year. Um, but we gotta we don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, the letter X. Throwing up the X. Des Bryant, just one former star still without work as offseason workouts approach across the league. Here are some other name brands. Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell, Melvin Ingram. Malik Hooker, maybe I missed one of these. Let me know if I did. Danny Amendola, maybe not a star, but Ricky loves him. Geno Atkins, Alshon Jeffrey, Justin Houston, Earl Thomas, the aforementioned Richard Sherman. Uh, a lot of name brands out there, um, and a lot of them that I just mentioned are going to find a home, but some of them won't, and I just thought that was worthy mentioning. There you go. X. Yeah, Dez wasn't pleased uh, that Tim Tebow got a contract before him. Des has got to make a play in the last five years before he complains about anything. I mean, you know neither is Tebow for that record, that? but what's what? that? You know that Des Bryant was um, uh, he, agitated? Think, yeah, he tweeted about it. Really? Or, or was quoted about it, yeah. He was like, come on. Well, that got on a lot of people's radars for a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of reasons. Des like, maybe not the best example of that because it, it was surprising when he was getting thrown pretty you know, key passes in important spots um, during right. the Ravens late playoff run or to the playoffs and even, even got some snaps in the playoffs. That was a, a bit of a surprise. No wonder the Ravens redid their wide receiver group. The letter Y <laughs> we throw it to Ricky Hollywood. The letter Y, why are we still in this show? <laughs> and it's been like an hour and a half. How do you do it, Ricky? How are you able to be the producer of this show? It, it must be so hard for you to do what you do. <laughs> it is really, really hard. <laughs> hey, I'll throw one out here. How about Isaac Yadam? Uh, Y-A-D-O-M. Yadam, Isaac. On Sunday morning, Station 29 um, of a local New York firefighting department responded uh, to a request from Yadam to rescue a kitten who had gotten stuck in the rear differential of his Maserati. They took apart the Maserati 
and got the kitten out of uh, the thing, and the kitten was fine. I Yadam didn't look too thrilled that they took apart his car. He was trying to smile. Okay, the kitten's fine. I'm not sure he was like pumped up about oh, this. Oh, I, I hope they didn't story. put the car back together. I hope they I mean, just I'm left. I mean, I'm sure they. Did. I'm sure they went to an auto place <laughs> and did it, but I don't know. It's... I just like hearing Greg say Yadam. Yadam. I don't know how to pronounce it. I hope that's how you pronounce it. I, I just like Greg sure. like throwing in a you know slice of life type uh, story to the podcast. That <laughs> Mark was told me right before the pod that I have to cover Y, and so that was what well, I got. Well, initially got. we had it for, so scheduled for Ricky, and yeah, so that got, was you know. that was uh, news to me. That's why I right. said Y. So, well, those, yeah, those improv good. classes let's, paid off. Let's bring it in for a landing. Uh, Mark Sessler, the letter Z. Well, let's bring it in for a landing with the Zach Wilson, the Jets quarterback. I know he looks 16 years old. Um, his little pink cheeks and blonde hair. He looks like a little boy that starred on Gross. That's So Raven. <laughs> but he is a man. Um, he is a man who zips lasers through in time lost Patriots defenders this autumn. Um, and I think he's a man from the age of cancel culture. And that's what the Jets, the Jets must do at this point. Just employ good old fashioned cancel culture. Ignore what's happened over the last 50 years um, of Jets territories and worlds. Kill it. Data wipe it. Everything's starting out new. Memory and then you it. what? Then you go cancel the rest of the AFC East. And you got Zach Wilson <laughs> dancing around with a burrito in his right hand, knocking out the Patriots the Dolphins and the Bills. It all starts now. Wait, so we, Land that they, jet. What are we doing? We're, we're, what are, the Jets we're, are, I, I love this, Mark. The Jets are canceling the Jets, but only right. the, the, the past, all the ugliness. All the um, culture of the past. Yes. Okay, so they're, how about we cancel the phrase cancel culture? Can we just cancel that? No one ever use it anymore? This will be the last time we apply okay. it to our society. <laughs> like it. Um, that would be that. nice. I'm very excited to, uh, as much as I... Uh, I struggled with the Sam Darnold thing. There is no, there is no, uh, there is no arguing that Jets have a more exciting um, outlook on their season with this kid in the building. So we'll see if you can play the guitar. So we canceled cancel culture, and we yeah, canceled uh, the Jets you know, culture. Baby yeah. in the bathwater. Like anyone, there. yeah, anyone using the phrase, you know, you're on. It's on the radar. It's on the radar at this point. All right, Mark, uh, Mark, Greg, great work. Ricky, I hope you're okay. Uh, anything else uh, before we say goodbye? I'd be scared to. Ricky is so anxious to end the episode. <laughs> it was Just... a joke. Take a joke. You're so uptight, Mark, in your bathing suit. Damn. <laughs> it is a tight bathing suit. Yeah, the, the little <laughs> Give them what they want, you know? It, it's surprising. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll send a um, send a shout out and some love to the, to the Wesseling family who... Uh, who celebrated Chris's life over the weekend uh, in Cincinnati, and um, and I, I got to be there. It was like um, it it just got me thinking, like what a complex guy Chris is. That there was so much like to learn about him, you know, still to go. And so that was, you know, what hurt being there. It was like a day that you would have wanted to have with him, um, because just like seeing seeing this place that you know his his ashes were spread which was this really special family house that owns owned by his uncle but like they spend every christmas eve there and it's like tens and you know there's so many of them and it's these two sides of the family and they're all like getting along and they're just like fascinating people chris was a fascinating person and complex and he he came from um such such great stock and uh they 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 did a great tribute to him in that everyone had you know was sad but also had a great time um together and like spent that time together and a lot of them i wanted to mention to you guys did mention to me like cousins and stuff how how much they like listening to um our shows when they talked about them some that are regular listeners and some that you know weren't but were like told hey listen to this and like how that really meant a ton to them and um and they wanted me to like pass that on too just like that like i don't know that it helped them and and they and they i think we all just want to be like closer to them still and that that's a way to do that that's great that's awesome that's great. And, and that's it's a beautiful uh, place <laughs> we're happy uh kind of represented the podcast there and we um are really looking forward we're all getting together um yep. all chris's uh family and friends getting together again and a few weeks and that's going to be awesome and uh yeah, yeah it's it's just the ongoing remembrance of a great man and uh, at, uh that's awesome 
That's awesome. Yeah, man. and Nick, uh, shout out to Nick, who I know set up a lot. He's he's still not thrilled that we had Phil on um, before him. There's some family heat, um, but I that's like good. that. That's that's what the Wesleyan family is all about. Little interbrother heat. We'll have to we'll have him on, but he he did a great job. But also to helps to come on thing. second. You 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 let um, the <laughs> brother one go first, and you know you scout his performance, and then you come in um, attempting to top it. Only and, adding to more controversy. So I more, absolutely. he's fine. ready. He's gonna come out firing. The he's more, halfway between no, no, forget you guys. I'm never coming on, and I'm gonna wipe the floor with him, which is like the exact reaction Chris I feel like would have. He is yeah. the most like Chris of all the brothers. It's it's amazing. Um, I was gonna say like the 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 simmering pot of anger and potential resentment. Like this could turn into a spice rack appearance. I mean, right. so spicy, I'm watch your back here. You might have a replacement uh, coming from your very uh, same town on the west side of Cincinnati. Um, all right, good. That's great. Love it. Love Wes. Miss him every day. Um, we missed you during this little break uh, from Wednesday to Tuesday. But we'll be back Thursday with a very special guest, the great Mina Kimes, uh, who is on literally every show on ESPN. So somehow she's going to carve out a little time for us here on the ATN Podcast, uh, and we look forward to that. This is Dan Hansa signing off for The Quiet Storm. The Mailman. Ricky Hollywood. Everybody, pray for Ricky. Hashtag pray for Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until Thursday, he's the call. 